Good afternoon, everybody. I am Elli Dahl from the Yrjö Janssen Foundation, and I have the pleasure to welcome you all to this lecture. Yrjö Janssen Foundation is a private trust founded to promote research in economics and medicine in Finland. And over the years, the foundation has awarded grants and supported science with almost 90 million euros. 60 years ago, the foundation launched Yrjö Janssen lecture series in order to invite top international scientists in economics to Finland. Here you can see all the previous lectures. The first one was given by Kenneth J. Arrow in 1963. And there has been 22 lectures so far. And the latest was given by Daron Asemoglu right before the corona pandemic. And today, we are very happy and honored to have Professor Janet Curry here in Helsinki to give the 23rd lecture. Professor Curry is a pioneer in the economic analysis of child development. Her current research focuses on socioeconomic differences in health and access to health care, environmental threats to health, the important role of mental health, and the long-run impact of health problems in pregnancy and early childhood. She is the Henry Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University and the co-director of Princeton Center for Health and Wellbeing. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and of the American Academy of Art and Sciences. She was named a Nomis Distinguished Scientist in 2019, and one of the top 10 women in economics by the World Economic Forum in 2015. Before I give the floor to Professor Curry, Terhi Machulski, the research director of the foundation, will say a few words. She will be moderating the discussions this afternoon. Thank you, Ellie, for the introduction. Uh, so first, I'm going to give you some technical practi practicalities about the, uh, today's program. So first, there will be one, uh, the first lecture, Child Health as Human Capital. So, and then there is uh, followed by the five to ten minutes questions and answers session. So after that, there will be about 20 minutes coffee break served in the hall. And then there will be the second lecture titled The Environment and Children's Health. And then there will be, after these two lectures, there will be wine serving. Uh, a little about the practicalities. So during the uh, lectures, so short clarifying questions are okay. But if you have some larger questions, so perhaps uh, leave the questions after each, each uh, lecture. So as Eli already said, uh, we are very happy and very honored to have you here in Helsinki. So, Janet Gree, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. It is a great honor to be here. Uh, perhaps a little intimidating to see the list of people who have spoken before me. Uh, but I hope you enjoy these lectures and find them stimulating. So I'm going to talk about child health as human capital. And the starting point for thinking about this is the economic concept of human capital, which is a very powerful 
and successful concept in economics. It captures two important ideas. One is that much of society's wealth is embedded in people. And the second is that if you invest in that human capital, it actually has a concrete return. So one of the things that I'm going to uh, try and convince you is that that's not just a piece of rhetoric spoken by uh, people who want to spend on social programs, but that it's actually true, especially when it comes to investing in children. So research on human capital formation initially focused primarily on education and also job training in the classic work by Becker and Mincer. Grossman was the first one to extend that framework to think about health as another form of human capital. His model is quite similar in building on Becker and Mincer. And within that sort of discipline of thinking about health economics over the past 30 years, there's been more and more attention to childhood as a time where investments might be especially productive. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is review some highlights from recent literature. I'm going to talk about an extended example of a policy intervention to improve child health and the returns to that. And then I'm going to suggest some directions for future research, including a greater focus on mental illness. So thinking a little bit about the conceptual framework, uh, a key concept here is a human capital production function. So I've given an example of a production function that thinks about there being two periods of childhood, period one and period two. In this example, there are going to be investments in period one and period two. Those are denoted by I. I put a bar over I1 to suggests that, well, the investment has already happened in period one, and now we're worrying about what to do in period two. Okay. This, um, these two periods have separate weights given by gamma. There's a productivity shifter given by capital A. There's um, different degrees of substitutability, perhaps, between investments in period one and investments in period two that are given by fee. Uh, and then the mu's here are shocks, so things that happen in period one or period two. So this is, of course, a two-period constant elasticity of substitution production function. Uh, and so facing that production function, the problem that the people concerned about the child face, and so let's assume that those are the parents here, is to, uh, of course, maximize their utility subject to a budget constraint, which is given here, and uh, to that production function that you just saw. So here, the parents are assumed to care about child health, which is little h. They also care about other things, so they don't only care about child health, and the weight that they put on those two things is given by alpha. So that's a sort of general framework that people use for thinking about this problem. And uh, a few comments that I can make on that, which I think are, are useful, are that um, all the families are going to be different in terms of the parameters that they face. Okay? And so if we're thinking about some sort of intervention in the system, a public policy of some sort, we could think about how it affects these different parameters. So, you know, prices can be affected by programs. If I have public health insurance, then I make health care free, which of course changes the price. If I have some sort of uh, parent training program, maybe I would be hoping to affect alpha, you know, by teaching people how important it is to invest in their children's health something like that. Uh, various types of technological change could also affect the 
productivity of investments in child health, and that could come by being a productivity shifter, or it could come by changing the ability to substitute uh, between periods. So I could think of some sorts of medical technologies. Okay. So every family is going to be different. Another thing uh, that comes out of this framework, we, we all know, you know, production functions are concave, and so the same investment can have a very different effect depending on where you start on the production function. So um, we might expect, for example, that poor children may benefit more from a given sort of investment than richer children because they have less to begin with. A third thing that comes out of that specific production function that I wrote is that it's flexible enough to allow the effects of early life interventions to grow over time instead of only depreciating. If you look at the uh, sort of classic Grossman framework, shocks wear off over time because they can only depreciate. Whereas in a more flexible model, you could have the effect of shocks uh, grow over time, which is important if you're thinking about early life as a particularly important period. Okay, so um, I've started off with this production function, which is kind of historical. A lot of the people who are interested in children uh, started off down that path. Uh, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to actually estimate these production functions, and you have to make a lot of simplifying assumptions. So even the production function that I wrote down, I have period one, period two. Okay, what is period one? What is period two? Uh, how do I measure all of the inputs? Uh, what is the form of the production function? So when it comes to evaluating policy, People don't normally go in this direction. They normally go in the direction of using a potential outcomes framework, uh, such as we saw the, the Nobel Prize for Card, Angrist, and Imbens uh, for elaborating on this framework. Uh, so in this framework, what we're thinking about is trying to mimic an experiment where we have treatments and controls. And so the fundamental problem is that, you know, we see one child, we see one thing happen to them, and we don't see the, the counterfactual thing that would have happened to them in some alternative world. So what we're searching for is some proxy for that alternative thing that would have happened to the child. So the essential problem then is to find a comparison control child whose outcomes are likely to have been similar to the treatment child in the absence of whatever policy it is that we're trying to evaluate. So most of the work that I'm going to talk about today is in that uh, tradition. So the example that I'm going to spend the most time on is thinking about expansions of health insurance coverage as an investment in children. And I'm going to use the American example of expansions of health insurance coverage for pregnant women and children, which began in the late 1980s and continued through the 1990s. So this is an old expansion that I'm talking about. It's not anything to do with the uh, most recent expansions under the Affordable Care Act starting in 2010. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you that these expansions had different impacts on poor and minority children, mostly because poor and minority children were more likely to be eligible for them. And a nice thing about using this older example is that it gives us an opportunity to see, well, what was the effect of the program, both in the short run, but also in the long run, since now these people who are affected are in their 30s. Okay, so... Medicaid is the largest U.S. social program affecting women and children. I've given some examples here of uh, two other large programs. One is an uh, income tax credit, the earned income tax credit. Another is a nutrition program, uh, 
it used to be called food stamps and now it's called the Special Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, so those are among the largest social programs, but you can see that they're dwarfed by spending on Medicaid. Okay. And here, uh, this isn't all spending on Medicaid. I've just tried to take out the part that's for women and children. Most spending on Medicaid is actually for elderly people in nursing homes, so that's uh, a whole other story. Uh, but you can see this is a very large program. And so it's worth asking, you know, is it worth it to spend all this money on this program? Okay. So this program began with expanding coverage for pregnant women. And I would say that one reason for that was the growing evidence that the fetal period is particularly important for human development. So this literature began in the medical and epidemiology fields, but um, economists have greatly extended it by looking at a much wider range of shocks from the original literature, which focused mostly on nutrition and famine, um, to looking at all kinds of things like pollution, as we'll talk about in a little while. And uh, a nice thing from the point of view of economists and thinking about trying to identify an effect is that the period of pregnancy is small, it's nine months. If I know your birthday, I know when you were in utero. If I knew where you live, I know what shocks that you were potentially uh, subjected to when you were in utero. And so that makes it relatively easy to try and see what the long-term effects are. Now, one of the really interesting things about this literature is that it shows that this paradigm that we've talked about for a long time is something nature or is it nurture, is not really a very useful paradigm because it's always both. There's an interaction between your uh, endowment, genetic or social, and what happens to you, and those things together affect your outcomes. So just as an example, uh, this figure is based on data for all births in the US state of California, and I'm just graphing the mother's birth weight against the child's birth weight. So you can see that in general, if the mother has higher birth weight, which is on the x-axis, then the child will have higher birth weight. So in some sense, this is a heritable thing. Uh, but the reason why there's two different lines here is because I've just graphed the simple data for uh, conditional on the mother's birth weight, how is the child's birth weight affected by the mother's socioeconomic status, which is measured here by saying, where did she live? Did she live in a high-income place, or did she live in a low-income place? Okay, so just dividing up the data into thirds, you can see in the raw data that uh, conditional on the mother's birth weight, the child's birth weight is higher if the mother's living in a rich place at the time of the birth. So environment is mediating uh, whatever this relationship is between uh, mother's birth weight and child's birth weight. Okay. Now, this expansion that I'm talking about is a nice thing to study, in part because it was very large. So here what I'm showing is the fraction of all U.S. 15 to 44-year-old women who were eligible for Medicaid coverage of their pregnancy. So that went up from a little over 10% in 1979 to over 40% by 1993. Uh, so this program it still remains very large, and in some states pays for half of all, all births. So most pregnant women are covered either by this program or by private health insurance. And so this filled the gap for all the women that weren't covered by private health insurance. Another nice thing about this, from the point of view of doing a study, is that the state started with very different thresholds for Medicaid coverage. So some states were very generous, some states were not generous, and so uh, since they were all brought up to the same level, that meant that there were much larger changes in some states than others. So what I'm trying to show in this figure uh, which is actually taken from a paper by 
Sarah Miller and Laura Weary, is that the dark-colored states had much larger increases in Medicaid coverage than the light-colored states. And you can use that to try and say, well, what's the effect of expanding coverage? So in some early work with Jonathan Gruber, we looked at the short-run effects of expanding Medicaid eligibility. And we used those differences in generosity across states as an instrumental variable uh, to control for whether somebody was eligible for health, this kind of health insurance. Right? So since this health insurance is aimed at poor people, being eligible for it means that you're also poor, being poor means that, on average, you have worse birth outcomes. So if you don't instrument, you could actually find negative effects of being eligible for insurance, right? Because it's capturing a lot of other things. Okay? So using this instrumental variables framework, we found that this led to a short-run 8.5% reduction in infant mortality. And you could show that that was in part due to improvements in accessing care. So for example, for poor women, we found a 50% reduction in the delay in obtaining prenatal care. Okay, so as I said, what's, what's exciting about this is that you can follow these children over time because these children who were born uh, in the 90s are now you know, 20 to 30 years old. And so uh, people in a wide range of studies have looked at the long-term effects and found uh, effects on a very wide range of outcomes. So again, this is from um, Miller and Weary's paper, and I'm showing the overall effects on blue bars and the effects for poor children using orange bars. Okay, so in terms of the overall effects, we find that this health coverage in utero was associated with improvements in health among these 20 to 30-year-olds. So we see a fall in the number of hospital visits in those cohorts, and we also see a fall in the number of chronic conditions in those cohorts. For the poor children, though, there's a much broader range of effects, bigger effects on health, but we also start seeing improvements in income, in the probability that they ever attended college, a decrease in the use of the nutrition program that I mentioned. And at the top here, uh, improvement in the Kessler score, well, what is that? That is an index of mental health. So there's actually some indication here that better health care during pregnancy is related to better mental health of the children at age 20 and 30. So that was for pregnant women. The next phase of this expansion was to uh, cover more children. And the way that this worked among children is that there was a sharp cutoff in eligibility by birth date. So only children who were born after September 1, 1983 were eligible for the expansions. Uh, if you were born on August 31st, 1983, you were out of luck. Uh, so this creates a discontinuity that people can use to try and identify the effects. And again, there's a lot of researchers who've looked at this on different outcomes. Just to show you how big this expansion was, uh, I have this figure which shows the fraction of children eligible by age. Um, so this was phased in that the youngest children were covered first. That's the line that's in dark blue. You can see that the coverage went up from around 20% to 50% of children. Uh, the oldest children, 13 to 17, are in the yellow line. And for them, the expansions didn't start until later, uh, and their coverage goes up from around 15% to over 40%. So again, um, most children in the US are covered by health insurance because either they now have this public health insurance or they have private health insurance. Okay, so again, this map is showing for two cohorts now, 
the people born in 1981, before the expansion, and the people born in 1984, uh, who benefited from the expansion. And it's showing the uh, sort of cumulative years of Medicaid eligibility that they enjoyed. So the point is that the later born cohorts had much more Medicaid eligibility than the earlier born cohorts. So to try and see what is the effect of this, um, one of the effects was reducing child mortality. Uh, a way to sort of quantify the effect of that is to compare the US to another country. I'm, I'm going to compare here to Canada, uh, which is arguably a good comparison for the US. There's many similarities in terms of levels of wealth, the type of medical technologies that are available, and even things like how much people drive, which is related to mortality due to accidents. Uh, but a big difference is that Canada's had universal public health insurance since the 70s, whereas in the US, they had this large expansion for pregnant women and children that I'm talking about, but and they also previously had covered elderly people over 65, but for that group in the middle between childhood and age 65, there was nothing until the Affordable Care Act in 2014. Okay, so in order to, to implement this comparison, what we do is uh, rank counties from the richest counties to the poorest, and then group them so that each group has approximately the same population. Then in each census year, we can compare mortality in different groups. So for, for example, you could think about comparing mortality in the bottom 5% of counties compared to the richest 5% of counties. So that's a framework that you can use that includes everybody, and it also uh, allows you to treat different countries in the same framework. Okay, so just to see how this works, um, this is a figure for zero to four-year-old girls. The red lines are for Canada, the blue lines are for the US, and along the x-axis here, we have uh, poverty percentiles. So zero means the richest place, and 100 means the poorest place. So what you can see is that the lines generally slope up. What that means is that mortality is higher in the poorer places. And then the focusing now on the blue lines, the top blue line is for 1990, and the bottom thicker blue line is for uh, 2010. Okay, so what you can see is over 20 years, the mortality rate for these girls fell, and it fell across the income distribution, but it fell more for poorer people than for richer people. Right? So the line gets flatter over time. You can see that Canada had lower mortality um, well, it's, a little sim it's quite similar in the richest place in 1990 in Canada and the US, but in the poorer places, there's a very big gap. Okay. But over this 20-year period, what you see is that the US line becomes much more similar to the Canadian line. So Canada still has an advantage in mortality across the income distribution, but the gap has been greatly reduced. So uh, looking at this in, uh, now for every age group and for three different time periods, what you can see is that this is kind of a, a general feature that you see that for children, a, there's a big decline in mortality in the US, especially in the poorer places. So it's bigger in the poorer places than in the richer places. Uh, you also see declines for the elderly, the 65 to 79 and above 80, there's some pretty big declines there. Uh, but you don't see as big declines for the middle-aged groups who didn't have health insurance coverage. So you're seeing a lot of the benefits of medical care arguably going to the people that have health insurance. 
And you see similar sorts of patterns for male mortality. Okay, so these Medicaid expansions seem to have reduced mortality and improved health among poor children, but uh, what about inequality? What about the survivors? Traditionally, economists think about human capital as something that increases incomes, since we're often concerned about incomes. And the availability of administrative data allows us to look at the long-term effect uh, on incomes by looking at cohorts who are affected compared to cohorts who are not affected by these expansions. This figure is drawn from work by Brown, Kowalski, and Lurie, which is looking at the effect of an additional year of Medicaid eligibility between ages 0 and 18 on the amount of taxes that people paid. Okay. The figures are normalized so that at age 19, so it's age along the x-axis, at age 19 they're normalized so that they're the same for three different groups. What are these groups? Well, there's the poorer people who have incomes less than 200% of a poverty line. There's a middle group, and then there's a, a rich group which has income greater than 500% of poverty. So what you can see is that following along from age 19 to age 28, an additional year of health insurance coverage is associated with paying about $800 more in taxes overall, with bigger effects for girls than for boys. Uh, and you can see that for the rich group, there's basically no effect. Okay? So the poor group that benefited, you see this large impact of uh, greater health insurance coverage on the amount of taxes that people are paid, which means that they're working more and they're getting paid more. So some of this increase in earnings may be coming through improved mental health. So why do I say that? Well, because mental health is one of the most important determinants of adult labor market outcomes. Uh, it's important especially because it affects work. If you look at people who are uh, on disability, a lot of them are on disability because they have mental health conditions. So worldwide, about a billion people are estimated to live with a mental health disorder, and half of these mental health disorders start by age 14. So it could be related to conditions in childhood. Now, economists have actually been talking about this in our own language for some period of time because we spend a lot of time talking about non-cognitive skills. So this concept uh, started by saying, well, cognitive skills, things like IQ scores are important, but then clearly there's other things which are also important, so we're just going to call those non-cognitive skills. But if you look at what these skills actually are, they're clearly related to mental health conditions. So I'm taking an example here from a paper by uh, Per Anders Eden, uh, Peter Fredriksson, and other co-authors, which is looking at Swedish data where the male draftees were all given these uh, personality assessments and tests to see how suitable they were for different military jobs. In this um, test, their non-cognitive skills were assessed, and these included social maturity, focus, internal motivation, and stress tolerance. Okay? Now, those concepts are things which kind of map into common mental health disorders. So if somebody has autism spectrum disorder, for example, then they're not going to score well on social maturity. If they have ADHD, then they're not going to score well on tests of focus. If they are depressed, then they may lack internal motivation. If they have anxiety, then they're going to have poor stress tolerance. So you can think of there being sort of a continuum of these different um, skills, where at one end, we say that people have some sort of mental health disability. <clears throat> 
This figure uh, by Hackman, Stixrud, and Azawa, sort of popularizing the idea of non-cognitive skills, it's based on data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth in the US, and it's just illustrating the relationship between these different kinds of skills and wages. So if you go along um, the bottom edge here, this is showing what happens if you have low non-cognitive skills, but better cognitive skills. So this corner would be people who have very good IQ scores, but very bad non-cognitive skills. And the blue is showing that their wages are not very high. We can do the same thing going along this edge and saying, oh, what happens if you have not very good IQ scores, but you know, excellent non-cognitive skills? Well, your wages are actually a little bit higher than over here. And of course, the people who have the highest wages are the people who have both types of skills. Right? So this is kind of formalizing something that we know intuitively, which is that there's many people who are very smart, but nevertheless not very successful because they lack other important skills that you need. Okay. Now, looking at the relationship between mental health and employment, this is a figure from the Eurostat database, based on the European Health Interview Survey, just looking at differences in employment rates between people with depression and without depression, and showing that there's a big gap across countries. Uh, so Finland is, oops, sorry. Finland is here. Uh, it looks pretty much the same as the Eurostat average. Uh, and you can see there's a very big gap there between employment rates of people with and without depression. You can also look at other types of data. This is from the UK Labour Force Survey showing the percentage of days lost. Uh, and clearly, the mental health has a lot bigger impact than the second biggest category, which is musculoskeletal. That's things like lower back pain, joint pain. Right? So we all know that there's a lot of people on disability with lower back pain, but did we know that there were so many days lost due to mental health? So as I mentioned, these mental health problems often begin in childhood and continue into adulthood. And so uh, in some of my work, I've tried first just to measure how uh, important these childhood mental health problems are for predicting uh, future outcomes. So this paper used administrative data from Canada to, to look at these effects. And what we tried to do was to compare the effects of common childhood mental health conditions to ch common childhood physical health conditions. So in our data, the most common uh, types of those two conditions were, uh, for physical conditions, asthma and injuries, and for mental health conditions, ADHD and conduct disorders. We look at the impact of diagnosis and treatment at four different age ranges, uh, and also looked at the impact of persistent conditions. So we had 50,000 children and their siblings. The records were merged to educational uh, attainment and also data on welfare use. Uh, in this Canadian province, people can go on welfare when they turn 18. And so um, somebody, when they exit school and go on welfare, they often then stay there for a long time. We compared uh, children with these conditions to their own siblings as a way to try and get a good control. And the outcomes we looked at were whether they were on welfare after age 18, whether they were in grade 12 by age 17, so that's kind of a measure of whether they're on time in school, and whether they took the courses that they need to take in high school in order to qualify to go to the public university. So in this province, Manitoba, there only is public university, and if you don't take these math courses in high school, you can't go there. So uh, 
These figures plot the estimated coefficients from our models, and the most striking takeaway is that the two physical health conditions, asthma and injuries, and these were coded as severe injuries, have actually relatively little effect on the probability of being on social assistance. But uh, ADHD or conduct disorders have large effects, particularly if people are still being treated for them at 14 to 18. Similarly, if we look at the effect on taking these math courses that you need to get into college, the ADHD and conduct disorders have very large effects compared to the physical health conditions. Okay, so just as a predictor of whether somebody's going to be able to go to college, whether they're going to end up on welfare, these mental health conditions are, are uh, very salient predictors. Okay. So we know that um, mental health conditions can be affected even by prenatal conditions. And some of the earliest evidence about that came from the Dutch hunger winter, where uh, women who were subjected to the famine while they were pregnant had children who had a higher risk of schizophrenia. Now, that's very interesting because schizophrenia is known to be highly heritable. So we know that uh, you know, if you have family members with schizophrenia, your risk is much higher, but it's still influenced by this environmental shock of having the famine. Right? So this is another illustration of that interaction between uh, genes and environment. Another interesting thing about schizophrenia is that it's probably pretty well measured. It's a very severe condition, and so um, people are... Uh, you know, very likely to be correctly coded as having schizophrenia if they have it. This is not the case for some other mental health conditions where the uh, rates of uh, diagnosis have gone up a lot over time. And looking at something a little bit milder, there's a paper by uh, Pedersen et al. that's using Danish twins data and finds a strong association between ADHD and birth weight, even in identical twins. So again, these are uh, twins that had the same genetic endowment, but twins are almost always different birth weight because they end up being located in slightly different places in the womb, and some get better nutrition than others during the pregnancy. Okay? So the smaller one had worse nutritional conditions during the pregnancy and is more likely to have ADHD. Another paper um, that shows this link is by Pearson and Rosen Slater using Swedish registry data, and they look at the effect of a severe shock to the mother during the pregnancy, which is the loss of a close relative. Now, I, I showed you earlier that you know, mortality isn't random in the population. If you're a, a poor person, you're more likely to suffer a death in your family than if you're a rich person. So you don't want to just look at people who had a death compared to everybody else. You need a better control. And so the control that they use are people who had the death of a close relative after the pregnancy. Okay? So the families are very similar. They all suffered a loss. It's a matter of whether the loss happened while the woman was pregnant and therefore whether that stress might have affected the fetus. And what they find using that comparison is that the affected children were 25% more likely to be using an ADHD drug in childhood and that they were more likely to be using drugs for anxiety or depression in adulthood. Okay? So there seemed to be a significant effect of these prenatal conditions. So this kind of leads to the question, well, it, you know, if everything was predetermined before you were even born, that would make it seem like intervention was difficult. Uh, but can we intervene during pregnancy to prevent future mental health problems? I showed you the data from Miller and Weary, which suggested that expanding health insurance coverage to pregnant women improved 
the Kessler scores, mental health scores, in the affected cohorts of children. In some other work uh, with Anna Chorney, we looked at participation in a different program. It's called the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC. Uh, and we looked at WIC participation during pregnancy and mental health of children measured at age 6 to 11. This WIC is, as the name suggests, a nutrition program, but it also involves medical care. So the program is usually offered in a medical clinic. It helps people get access to medical care. The children in our study were born between 2004 and 2009, and we can follow them up to 2015 in the administrative Medicaid data. And what we find is that Compared to their own siblings, children whose mothers got WIC during the pregnancy were less likely to have ADHD and less likely to have other mental health conditions that are commonly diagnosed in early childhood. We also found larger effects for black children than for all children, uh, and you know, some evidence that there might be larger effects for low-income children as well of getting this kind of support. Okay, so I think what I've showed you so far may be leading you to ask this question, which is, you know, okay, you said that providing health insurance and providing programs like WIC should be having a positive effect on mental health, but all we hear about all the time is how children's mental health is getting worse, right? So if we're doing so much more for people, then why is their mental health worse? Okay. So, I don't think we have a complete answer to this question, but I want to point out that one of the things that's going on here is that the diagnostic standards for many conditions have changed a lot over time. Um, a very important example of that is autism. So you often hear reports about how autism rates are skyrocketing. And one reason for that is because uh, the new uh, diagnostic standards combine two categories that were previously separate. So there used to be a category for autism and a category for Asperger's, which is milder. And then both those two categories were combined into something called autism spectrum disorder. Right? So now, if you just sort of casually look at it, you see, oh, there's many more people with autism than there were before. Okay? So that's one thing you have to be careful about. Another thing is that by giving people more access to care, you give them more access to screening, and if you screen more people, then you find more problems. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of that, uh, which has to do with a change in the way that uh, Medicaid services were compensated. Right? So doctors provide services, they get compensation from the government for doing that, and uh, the change here involved switching from a fee-for-service regime where I do a service, I send a bill, I get compensated, to a, a capitated payment plan. So under the capitated payment plan, the doctor gets one payment that's supposed to cover all of the care for the person. Now, that obviously creates an incentive to provide too little care instead of too much care. And so to deal with that problem, the government put uh, requirements on the providers that they have to do certain screening. If they don't do certain screening, then they will uh, have less compensation. Okay? So uh, this plan was implemented in South Carolina, where we study, uh, over a year period, and it was at different times in different counties. And so we study this using two different designs. One is an event study, where we're looking at all the children before and after the switch. And the second is that we follow the same child over time, and we look at what happens to the same child when the insurance regime changes. So all of these children were all covered by Medicaid all of the time in our study. Uh, 
and we're just looking at how the way you compensate the doctor affects what happens. Okay, so here's the event study. You can see at the top that well child screenings go up. That was one of the things that they were supposed to do. And along with the well child screenings, a very similar pattern uh, are diagnoses of ADHD. Right? So I do more screening, I find more cases. If I look at the same child over time, I also see that the same child is more likely to get a well child screening, a developmental screening. They're even more likely to get vaccinated, which is kind of shocking because the doctors were always supposed to be doing vaccinations. Uh, and they're more likely to get sick visits. Just uh, looking at chronic conditions, another aspect of this is that that capitated payment that the doctors get is higher if the child has a chronic condition, right? Because they have to provide more services. And so the doctor has some incentive to diagnose chronic conditions. And so you can see here they diagnose more ADHD, they diagnose more depression, they also diagnose more physical health conditions like asthma, um, ear, nose, and throat, and autoimmune disorders. Um, the, the mild infection bar is kind of interesting because the doctors didn't receive higher capitation for treating that. So I think that that just shows the effect of seeing doctors more often, that you're more likely to detect these relatively mild um, illnesses as well. Okay. So you can see that just this relatively small change in how doctors are being compensated led to a big increase in diagnosis of all kinds of things. Another example that I want to talk about is for New Jersey. So one of the things there's been a, a great deal of discussion about in the United States is rising suicide rates among the young, which obviously is a very serious topic. What I'm showing here are data from New Jersey. The black line shows suicide deaths for 10 to 18-year-olds. And you can see that's kind of noisy. Um, and it looks like it might be trending up slightly, but uh, there's not like a huge trend. And then because that's noisy, I also show the brown line, which is suicide deaths in this age group for the whole Northeast region. And again, you can see that that goes up slightly. Uh, but then the blue line is showing suicide-related hospital visits in New Jersey. Okay, so suicides are not going up a lot, but these suicide-related hospital visits go up a lot. Uh, there's actually two points where they sort of tick up. One is in 2012, and the big one here is after 2016. Okay, so you might ask, well, what was going on in 2012 and 2016? Okay. Um, the 2012 change may be related to new screening, especially for girls. So there was new screening uh, guidance that came out that said that uh, you should screen girls more carefully for uh, suicidal ideation. And what we see is that most of this increase in suicide-related hospital visits is accounted for by a diagnosis of suicidal ideation. It's, it's coded, that's, that's here, it's coded as a secondary diagnosis. That means your primary diagnosis might be something like depression, and then you have a secondary diagnosis of suicidal ideation. You can see the red line are, is actual self-injury or intentional self-harm. That shows no trend. And then the uh, dotted blue line is suicidal ideation as the primary diagnosis. Okay. So uh, the fact that they're coding more suicidal ideation seems to be accounting for this uptick. Why did they start coding this? Well, because, again, they received instructions that they were supposed to be coding it, right? So you're supposed to code suicidal ideation if the primary diagnosis is a mental health condition, and this is present. 
Okay. So you can see that the instructions that doctors receive, even in the absence of incentives for compensation, also have an effect on how things get diagnosed. Okay. So there's a lot going on here in terms of, of basically data quality that should make you question what you see about trends. Okay, so I want, just wanted to address this issue also because I, I've been asked a lot here in Finland about this. Um, is social media causing an upswing in youth mental health problems? Uh, everybody seems to think so in, in terms of the public and the media. Uh, there have been many, many scientific studies of this, mostly correlational studies, and they generally find that the correlations are very small. So the correlations cannot explain the number of people out there with mental health conditions. So I'm not saying that this might not be an important factor in some individual cases, but as a society-wide phenomena, this is definitely not driving what we see. So first of all, there may not even be a huge increase in mental health problems. And secondly, uh, the... If there is an increase, it's probably not being caused mainly by social media. Okay, so uh, we've sort of talked a little bit about prevention, a little bit about measurement and diagnosis of child mental health conditions. I also want to touch on uh, treatment. So uh, here, I would argue that just as the U.S., can serve as a good laboratory for understanding the effects of health insurance. It can also serve as a laboratory for understanding the effects of variation in treatment. And the reason for that is because there are huge variations in treatment across areas. There's also, uh, of course, the data is not as good as here, but there is increasing availability of administrative data in the U.S. that we can use to look at these issues. So looking at the variation across areas, this map is showing county-level data on the number of prescriptions of antidepressant drugs uh, by county per thousand teenagers. Okay. The darkest red here is 967 prescriptions per thousand persons. Of course, these are 30-day prescriptions, so it doesn't mean that everybody's taking antidepressants all the time, but it's still a very large number. And then the lightest shade here is zero. Okay? So we're going from counties where the per capita rate is almost one to counties where the per capita rate is almost zero. There's huge variation. In some uh, forthcoming work, we tried to look at the effect of this variation in mental health treatment on health outcomes. And we have a sample of children who were all privately insured by a large health insurer. We tried to select children who were first observed before age 11 and then had an initial mental health episode. The reason why we were trying to capture the first time somebody got treated is because there's a lot of stickiness in how people get treated. Once you start with one regime, then people tend to stay on that regime over time. And so we thought, well, clinicians have more of a choice when they're dealing with a, you know, a fresh case. What we do also is to use these geographic measures as an instrument for the way that people get treated. So the idea is that if I'm in a place where everybody gets antidepressants, then probably when I come in, I will get antidepressants. If I'm in one of these places where no one gets them, then I wouldn't get them. Okay. We look here at depression, anxiety, and adjustment disorders with features of anxiety and depression. This figure is kind of showing why we look at those things together, because there's a lot of overlap, um, and it's hard to distinguish uh, between these different conditions, and they're also treated quite similarly. We're going to look at treatment and consider the extent to which the treatment is 
uh, consistent with guidelines. So the guidelines usually say something along the lines of children should try therapy before they get medication, and then uh, they will give some guidance about the medication. So one type of guidance is to say, well, is this drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in children of this age? Okay. Uh, a problem with that, you might think, okay, well, all the medications should be approved by the FDA. One reason why a clinician might want to consider other drugs is that very few drugs are actually approved for use in children. The reason for that is to get it approved, you have to go through a clinical trial, which is very expensive. The drug manufacturers, once they have the drug approved and on the market, um, they've done a clinical trial for adults. Maybe they don't find it worthwhile to do a clinical trial for children. So there is no clinical trial, and so therefore it can't be FDA approved. But clinicians might think that a particular drug is useful. And so uh, what they could do is to follow a professional guideline that sanctioned some specific use of these non-FDA-approved drugs. So this is called off-label prescribing, if it's not FDA-approved. Um, so we're going to call those like gray area prescribing because it's not FDA approved, but some association says that it might be a good thing to do. And then the third category here are um, things that you should avoid. So not only is it not FDA approved, but no professional association says it's a good idea, and the professional association may actually say that it's a bad idea. Okay, so we're going to call that a red flag drug. Okay, so just to give you an example of what these type of guidelines look like, um, you have different um, academies, like the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of Pediatrics, and they put out periodically these guidelines, and they say things like, you know, well, um, you should try therapy, uh, if you need to try drugs, that SSRIs are a good choice. Uh, this one is FDA approved, so you could consider that. Uh, these say you shouldn't use tricyclic antidepressants because they have more side effects and they can be fatal in overdose. Uh, and then um, these guidelines don't say anything very specific about benzodiazepines, but they don't recommend them. So looking at our sample characteristics, uh, what we see is that only about 75% of the children get any treatment after uh, their initial episode, and this is despite the fact that they're all privately insured. Of these children, 57% uh, get therapy only, which is probably appropriate. 10% uh, get therapy and drugs, which may be appropriate. Another 8% are only getting drugs. And then if we look at the 18% of kids that got drugs, about 4% are getting FDA-approved drugs, 10% are getting these sort of gray area drugs, and 4% are getting red flag drugs that arguably they shouldn't be getting at all. Looking at other characteristics of the sample, a lot of these kids have another neurodevelopmental condition like ADHD. So it's just interesting to note that kids with ADHD have a three times higher probability of getting depression later on. Um, the first time that we see these people on average is about eight years old, and then the first mental health episode that they have is at 12 years old. Uh, and we can see that the children who are given these red flag drugs, tend to be the most severely ill, as uh, measured by things like, where did they first show up in the data? So if you first show up because you're in the hospital or because you went to the emergency room, that's more severe than if you first show up because you got some kind of evaluation. 
So in terms of outcomes, uh, I think self-harm is one of the most important outcomes. We're not looking directly at suicide here because there's very few suicides in our data, but we can look at other types of self-harm, including attempted suicides. Uh, we also look at spending. This is claims data. And we look at uh, facility use. So did the patients go to the hospital? Did the patients go to the emergency room? And we follow patients at three months, 12 months, and 24 months. So the reason, this is a relatively short window, and I wish that we could follow people for longer. One of the big limitations in our data, which you wouldn't have if somebody wanted to do this here, is that uh, because these people are privately insured, if their parents change jobs, then they drop out of our sample. So if we start trying to look at long-term outcomes, we get a smaller and smaller sample. Okay, so looking at the outcomes, you can see that the, again, let's just focus on the last three columns, the kids who are getting these red flag drugs are more likely to be hospitalized after 24 months, they're more likely to have self-harm, they're more likely to go to the emergency room, and they have higher costs. Now, that could be because they were more severely ill to begin with, which is why we need to uh, adopt some sort of instrumental variables strategy. So the treatments are not randomly assigned. If the sickest people are the most likely to get treatment or they're the most likely to get aggressive treatments, then we might falsely conclude that those treatments were causing harm to people. Uh, the converse is also true. It could be that you have some high socioeconomic status teens whose parents are sort of really concerned and that maybe more high socioeconomic status people are more likely to get treated and have better outcomes. So to deal with this, we use measures of local area practice style, um, the kinds of things that I was showing you about the... Um, uh, prescription intensity, and we interact those with measures of the patient, like where we first saw them, their age, their gender. This gives us a lot of potential predictors. So in order to avoid a weak instrument problem, we use machine learning to select the best potential predictors and then use those as our instrumental variables. So... What do we find? Uh, I've put our main findings here into a kind of a tree. Uh, and you can think about the first decision being, did they get treated within three months? Yes or no. If they get treated, the cost is higher than if they didn't get treated. Okay. So that's not so surprising. It costs money to treat people. So um, that often turns out to be the case. The next question might be, well, if they got treated, what kind of drugs, if any, did they get? Uh, and it turns out, this was the first thing that surprised me, was that the cost of treatment is lower if they got drugs than if they did not get drugs. Okay, so if they're getting treated and they didn't get drugs, they're getting therapy only. Um, and that turns out to be more expensive. Okay. Now... If they get drugs, though, there's this question of, well, what kind of drugs did they get? There's red flag, gray area, and FDA-approved drugs. And what we find is that the low cost is the gray area drugs, the ones that the professional associations are uh, approving. The FDA-approved drugs are actually pretty expensive, uh, and the red flag drugs are also causing higher cost. Uh, we think this could be through two different mechanisms. The red flag drugs do have higher incidence of side effects, so they could actually be putting people in the hospital for side effects. The FDA-approved drugs um, shouldn't do that, but uh, might not work very well. So you might end up having a trial with a drug that just doesn't work at all for you, and then you have to um, use other means if you're not going to turn to one of these other possibilities. Um, 
Looking at self-harm, we see, um, again, say looking at the bottom tier here, that the highest probability of self-harm is the people taking the red flag drugs, followed by these gray area drugs, and that the FDA-approved drugs have the lowest probability of harm. So there seems to be a little bit of a trade-off here in that um, the FDA is very careful to try and approve drugs that will not cause harm, but those drugs might not be very effective for everybody, leading to higher cost. Um, whereas these gray area drugs don't have as big of an effect in terms of preventing self-harm, but are very uh, inexpensive relative to the alternatives and considering all of the medical costs. So a summary of what we found is that most physicians who prescribe to children are prescribing either the FDA-approved drugs or drugs that are consistent with professional guidelines, which is 55% of them. Um, so this is suggestive that having these types of guidelines helps to scale research findings into professional practice. We also find that children whose clinicians don't follow these guidelines, who are prescribing these red flag drugs that are neither FDA approved nor professionally sanctioned, have the worst outcomes in terms of self-harm, facility use, and total cost. Uh, so this actually opens a lot of potential research questions, just in terms of physician behavior. Like, why are these people prescribing these drugs that you know, no one says that they should be using? Uh, is it marketing? We know that there is marketing of things like benzodiazepines directly to doctors. Uh, could it be training and cohort effects? Um, we see, for example, that older doctors are more likely to be prescribing older drugs, which the tricyclic antidepressants includes. So there, is, there does seem to be a lot of stickiness in training that people go to medical school, they learn certain things, and then they use those things even if the guidelines change ex post. Um, and it's important to note that the U.S. physicians are not directly profiting from drug sales. It's not like they're selling drugs to the patients. Um, so it's probably not that. Okay, so uh, before I conclude, I just wanted to address uh, one additional question that I often get, which is, what is the most effective way to invest in children? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. But what I want to highlight is this paper by Nathaniel Hendren and Ben Sprunkheiser, which suggests that that might be the wrong question to ask. So what this paper does is it looks at 133 different social programs where they consider that there's very good causal evidence about the effect of the program. And then they try and put the program effects into the same framework for all of the programs so that they can compare across programs. And the way that they do that is by calculating what they call the marginal value of public funds, which takes all the known benefits of the program and sets it against the cost to the government. Now, uh, most of these programs have marginal values of public funds which are clustered around one, meaning that the social benefit is somewhat similar to the cost to the government. So you might want to do that or you might want to not want to do that depending on your political priorities. The circle here are the estimates that they have about various programs for children um, grouped into child education and child health. Okay. Um, the point here is that these have very high marginal values of public funds. Um, in fact, they sort of define the marginal value of public funds as being infinite if the, there's a social value and there's no net cost to government. Okay. So... The child programs here have a huge return 
compared to the other programs. So I want to suggest that the appropriate question to ask is not like which child program should we be spending money on, but the appropriate question is like, well, why? And this is of course in the U.S. Why aren't they spending more money on these programs, which are shown to be effective? There's a lot of evidence that they're effective. Um, Okay, so just to uh, conclude then, I hope I've convinced you that child health is one of the most important forms of human capital, that it affects employment and wages, as well as affecting long-term health outcomes. The interventions that I'm talking about really are investments in the sort of classical sense that they have returns, and you can measure the returns. I think um, one of the areas that's important for research is that, uh, and as I highlighted in my talk, most of the research is really focusing on early childhood. So we, we all know now that pregnancy is a very important period, early childhood is a very important period, but adolescence is probably a very important period also. Many of these mental health problems first appear in adolescence. That's the point at which they're getting treated. And so um, more research into adolescence and ways to promote healthy adolescence and treat mental health in that period uh, would probably be very useful. So I'll stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions. for your lecture. So now we have 10 minutes time to questions if you have any. So there's one, Ramin. Hello. Hi. Thanks. So my name is Ramin. Um, I wanted to ask a question relating to um, child's mental health and, and social media. So there seems to be growing evidence, not only in the United States, but across the developed world, that there's a differential trend in the development of mental health in the sense that girls seem to be experiencing more, at least, diagnosis of mental health issues relative to boys. So since it's happening around developed countries, not can it only be about diagnostic criteria changing, or, or how should we interpret First of all, is, is my take of the evidence correct? And second, what should we make of it? What should, what should be the main hypothesis, if not the effect of social media, on differentially on girls relative to boys? So you're arguing that there's an increasing gap? So there seems to be, I mean, it seems pretty current. I'm not sure how much of that is yet peer-reviewed or, or published, but there seems to be at least Jonathan Haidt, for example, has collected a review on data from different countries in Europe and, and the English-speaking world that shows that girls' mental health problems are increasing more relative to boys after 2010. So I'm wondering if not, I'm kind of this differential trend seems to be the puzzle here. Right. Um, so and, yeah. I think, I think that research based on trends in mental health is very problematic for some of the reasons that I was showing. Um, in terms of gender gaps, it's well known that women are more subject to depression than men. Um, so if you're going to diagnose depression more, you're probably going to pick up more cases in women. Um, whether mental health problems are more prevalent in women in general, I don't think that's true. Um, we, men are more likely to commit suicide, uh, men are more likely to have ADHD, men are more likely to have conduct disorders and uh, other antisocial disorders. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not really very convinced. I don't know the article, so I'd have to look at it, but I think you have to just be really careful looking at these, these trends over time. Thank you. And then Christine, I'm here. 
Thank you for a really interesting talk. So I was wondering about the, uh, the variation in the Medicaid expansion, and I'm wondering about the U.S. system, uh, or can you say something about uh, the remaining inequality that we still have in the health system there, because it's it's not like universal health care for everyone. We have the people on, or you have people on private insurance, people on Medicare. And I was wondering that whether with this, you know, the variation that you were exploiting, my understanding is that it's mainly to look at those that were had no access to any insurance whatsoever before, but whether we still have a kind of, uh, when we kind of think about the overall inequality between, like you showed these figures between, uh, on the mortality inequality between different, uh, Canada, in Canada and US, whether there is like a, uh, whether we know a lot about the remaining inequality between the system where the private, you know, whether the people who, or the kids who have the access to private uh, insurance, whether the insurance covers different type of uh, uh, health care than, than uh, the other. Um, yeah, uh, that, that, that's a good question. I, I think it's fair to say that it is kind of a two-tiered system because not every provider accepts Medicaid. And there's still a lot of variation across states because the Medicaid programs are run by the state and they don't all compensate physicians in the same way. So some of them are much more generous uh, than others. And the... Uh, uh, federal government hasn't really been able to eliminate those kinds of disparities. There's also a sort of interesting but distressing phenomena that's been going on where the uh, state governments that want to reduce their expenditure on Medicaid, which is one of the largest things that state governments spend money on, um, can do so just by making it more difficult to remain enrolled. So, the, so under the Affordable Care Act, they weren't allowed to kick people uh, off by changing the eligibility threshold. So the eligibility threshold stays the same, but then they start asking for more paperwork or asking for paperwork at more frequent intervals. And whenever they do those things, then people uh, end up leaving the program. Hey, the, the, no. No, uh, uh, yes, uh, if you oh, okay. first right. and then, yeah. okay. Thanks so much, great talk. Um, so I'm pretty convinced by what you've done and others that the return on investment on these childhood programs are really large. So what do you think is the intransigence, in, especially in the U.S. context, in terms of policymakers being unwilling to fund these things? You know, what is the research community? Should we be doing better? What, what, what do you think is causing them not to want to act? So... Yeah, it is really distressing what's going on in the United States at many levels, but I actually think it's part of the sort of anti-science um, uh, populism, you know, that having scientists come and say, you know, oh, we have good evidence of this and that, uh, is not so compelling to a lot of people anymore. And so, you know, what do we need to do to counteract that? I'm not sure. Uh, whether we should all be more savvy on social media or, uh, you know, how, how we combat misinformation. I mean, I think the pandemic was a really good example of the sort of barriers that we face to getting the word out there. So you had a lot of scientists working as hard as they could to try and figure out what's going on with this thing and putting out new information. And the new information just kind of confused everybody and seemed to, there seemed to be an opening for all kinds of misinformation about, you know, that vaccines were gonna make you sick or make you sterile or, you know, do all kinds of things. Um, and we didn't combat that very effectively, you know, so, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what to do about it, but I do, <laughs> again, I think that would be a useful um, place to do research, maybe not so much by economists, but uh, just what are the 
what are the most effective ways to get word out there when there is a scientific consensus about something? And how can we avoid having you know, newspaper articles where you know, 99% of the, like we used to have on climate change, right? We'd have like 99.9% .9 of the world scientists think that climate change is a real thing, and we have 0.1% you know, of scientists who are willing to say like, oh, it's not man-made or something like that, and then they get equal time uh, when we see journalism about this, right? Like, I don't know what we can do about that, but if we could do something, it would be great. Julia? <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Now, I'd like to take you a few years back to the Finnish politics when we had a heated debate on, in terms of whether one should extend the compulsory schooling by one year from the age 17 to 18. And at the time, there was a lot of talk about whether it would, the money would be more better spent by uh, investing it in the early years or extending the, the schooling by one year. So what kind of advice would you have given us, and if you don't give us the advice, what is the type of research that we are lacking on this front? Thank you. I, I guess the right thing to do depends in part on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I know some of the research on extending compulsory schooling um, uh, often by one year in other contexts found positive effects by keeping people out of trouble, for example, sort of incapacitation effect. If you're, not, if you're in school, then you're not doing these other things that might be harmful. Um, that's probably a low bar for a social policy. Um, I, I guess you'd also have to think about how it interacted with, with university. So would the idea be that people would get an extra year in high school and then maybe fewer of them would go to university? Um, I think that kind of coordination would be really important to, to think about. And then on the younger side, for the early years, I guess um, I, I know you have good preschool and you have good child care. And so... Um, what you're talking about is really like a marginal improvement about what you already have. Uh, and so that's different than saying, like, well, if you had no preschool, what happens if we have, you know, now a, a preschool? Um, the benefits might be small to, to, you know, making the daycare a little bit more formal. So I understand there's an experiment going on right now that's supposed to address that, so... <laughs> One more quick question, Otto. So thanks. Going back to the returns on investment, so you showed us evidence on, on the returns on, on those who were directly affected by the policy, but I guess these have all kinds of externalities, say, on the immediate family members or later on on the job market. So uh, any evidence on those? That's a really great question, actually. Um, so most of the literature about kind of spillovers within the family has talked about the effects of uh, child health problems on mothers. Because it seems to be usually the, the mothers who bear most of the burden. And so there's pretty good evidence that it's harmful to families, like families are more likely to split up, uh, mothers are more likely to drop out of the labor force. Uh, and so, you know, preventing those problems could have a big payoff in terms of, of female labor force participation and also, you know, family uh, unity. Thank you very much. Again. <laughs> Very nice lecture. Now we will have a 20 minutes break. As usual, there will be coffee and healthy snacks like fruits and some unhealthy snacks like sugar.
It's your <laughs> choice. I'm not here to judge you, so we will pack in 20 past you. Thank you very much. I, um, I appreciate that everybody's in here on such a beautiful day. Uh, I, I know that uh, you don't always get such great weather in Helsinki, so I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, some research on pollution and child health. So as we've been talking, uh, pregnancy and early childhood are considered critical periods for child development. And we know that both nature and nurture and their interactions are important for child development. One way we think that the environment may matter is by um, affecting gene expression. Uh, and so the environment could serve to either mitigate or reinforce differences. That's the environment very broadly defined. Now, uh, in the US context, there are very big differences in things like health at birth. Uh, so this example is using all the vital statistics, natality data, or birth certificates, and just uh, looking at contrasts for different groups. So, uh, and the measure here is birth weight less than 2,500 grams, which is considered to be the threshold for low birth weight. So what you can see is that uh, African-American mothers have higher incidence of low birth weight than other mothers. If we just look at white mothers and look at differences by education, those are also very large. Uh, again, if we just look at white mothers and compare single versus married mothers, we see large differences. And if we think about uh, different types of disadvantage intersecting or accumulating, that's what's shown in the last two columns where I'm comparing African-American women with less than a high school education to white college-educated women. And there you can see a very large contrast, more than three times greater probability of having low birth weight. So one of the questions that I want to address in this lecture is how much of that might possibly be due to differences in environmental exposures. So pollution um, is a potential source of inequality if some groups are consistently exposed to higher levels of, of pollution, and I'm going to talk mostly about air pollution. And we know in the US context, African Americans have a higher incidence of low birth weight, as I was showing you. They also have higher infant mortality rates, lower life expectancy, lower wages, and less wealth. Uh, these are all things that have been examined with respect to pollution, that pollution causes reductions in all of these things. So, you know, maybe some of these deficits could be due to uh, differential exposures. Um, as I mentioned, air pollution has been shown to have many negative effects, a higher risk of death, and negative effects on health of surviving infants, such as uh, reflected in low birth weight, increases in hospitalization, due to especially respiratory conditions, but also circulatory conditions, so air pollution can cause heart attacks. Um, there's an interesting line of research looking at reductions in cognitive ability, so things ranging from children writing standardized tests and doing worse on high pollution days to uh, Wall Street stock traders making more mistakes on high pollution days. And some of the oldest literature in environmental economics looked at effects on property values, and we know that pollution has negative effects on property values. So all of these things that I was talking about are things that are affected by pollution. Now, uh, in terms of whether these could possibly explain inequality, you have to show that different groups are differentially affected, and that too seems to have been shown. 
So in the US, poor people and people of color are more exposed to hazardous waste sites. That was one of the first things that uh, people started investigating. They're also more exposed to facilities that emit toxics. Uh, they're exposed to more air pollution in general, just measured by standard air quality monitors. They live closer to busy streets, and so they're exposed more to traffic. Uh, and there's also literature showing that they're more subject to lead poisoning, both because of being close to traffic, but also being in older homes that are more likely to have lead paint or lead uh, water pipes. Uh, so these are just some examples, and then there's, uh, like, this is really a very big literature, so there's surveys that I'm listing here that also talk about this differential exposure. Now, you know, why is there this differential exposure? The leading reason is residential segregation. And uh, so if people are living in different places, then obviously they're going to be exposed to different things. This figure is using census data, uh, and it's a dot map where each dot represents 200 people. And here the blue dots are for African Americans, and the orange dots are for everybody else. And this is actually, this isn't the Deep South. This is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay? So this is a northern state. And you still see this type of residential segregation where African Americans are heavily concentrated in certain neighborhoods. You could also do this by income, and you would also see a lot of segregation by income. And in fact, over time in the United States, the residential segregation by race has gotten smaller, but residential segregation by income has gotten bigger. Okay, so this concern about differential exposure has led to an environmental justice movement. Uh, some of the earliest studies of this were in the 80s in the United States. So uh, one of the first studies was by the U.S. General Accounting Office, which is interesting that it has this very bureaucratic name, but what this thing is, is an agency that exists to do research for the Congress. So if somebody in the Congress is interested in some kind of question, they can ask the General Accounting Office to look into it. And so in this case, they were asked to look into allegations that hazardous waste sites tended to be cited in African-American communities. And they found uh, that that was true. There was also... At the same time, a very influential report that was by a church, the United Church of Christ, which is a church that is largely African American, and they put out a, a very sophisticated report about the relationship between being close to toxic wastes and race in the United States. Uh, a nice thing about their report, it's full of maps, and they have these maps where they shade African American areas, and then they just show where all the toxic waste sites are. So you can visually see for a whole lot of the largest counties in the United States that there's a correlation there. There's also an international uh, movement talking about environmental justice issues, doing things like trying to measure the amount of climate-related disaster losses as a percentage of GDP, showing that those are much higher in low-income country, com countries than in high-income countries, even though the high-income countries are responsible for most of the CO2 emissions historically. That's one aspect. Another aspect has to do with the regulation of dirty industries and the idea that those are just getting pushed to poorer countries. So the paper that I cite here is a paper about recycling of lead batteries, and the regulations for that were greatly strengthened in the United States with the result that the battery plants all moved to Mexico. Right? So the, it, it didn't 
get rid of the pollution that just shifted it around. Some of the policy responses in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency has been ordered to address and study this issue. Um, so they came up with a definition that said that fair treatment means no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial operations or policies. So that's kind of the aspiration that things should be fair. There's also the Aarhus Convention saying that policy should protect the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environment adequate to his or her health and well-being. So that's a stronger statement that we should actually uh, make things better, not just that we should make them fair. Um, so I think these raise questions about whether improving the environment more generally is also going to address environmental justice. So I'll come back to that question. Now, um, over time, uh, in developed countries, pollution has actually gotten a lot better. So this is an example uh, from the United States. It's from the uh, EPA website, actually. And so the purple line at the bottom here is showing uh, an aggregated measure of the six different criterion pollutants that they track, um, particulates, carbon monoxide, lead, sulfur dioxide, um, and then I always forget some of them. But anyway, what you can see is that that's going down over time. You can also see that CO2 emissions are going down over time. Uh, and that's true, even though energy consumption has basically been flat, population has grown up slightly, and you also see increases in vehicle miles traveled and increases in gross domestic product over this period from 1970 to 2020. So um, it seems like we're making some progress, maybe not fast enough, but um, these pollutants have fallen. And we saw in my earlier lecture that there's also been improvements in the health of infants and children. Here I'm just showing mortality rates for age zero, age one to four. I showed them separately for uh, males and females. Um, females always have lower mortality at all ages, pretty much. Um, but you can see the declining trend in mortality. I was arguing in my earlier lecture that some of that is probably due to improvements in medical care and access to medical care, but maybe some of it also has to do with these declining trends in pollution exposure. So another thing that's been going on is that uh, sort of in the background of all of this is that we have increases in economic inequality. And we know that child health is strongly linked to socioeconomic status, that these inequalities have been increasing over time, and yet the inequalities in child health have been narrowing. Um, so possibly some of this could be due to these reductions in pollution, given that the poorest and minority people were more likely to be exposed to pollution to begin with. Now, most studies looking at pollution and health are either examining infants or examining the elderly. Uh, an important reason for that in the U.S. is because that's, those are the groups where we have data. We have all this data on birth certificates. We have a unified federal system of health insurance for people over 65, so we have basically register data for people over 65. But then in between birth and age 65, it's very hard to uh, find good data on health. So that's one reason. A second reason is more substantive, which is that the effects are likely larger for infants and older people than for people of prime age. So it's easier to see effects in those age groups. And... Uh, an advantage of looking at infants in particular 
is, you know, they've only been alive for a short period of time, so you don't have to worry about there being a very long latency period. Whereas for adults, uh, looking at something like the relationship between cancer rates and pollution exposure is very complicated by the fact that they could have a very long latency rate. People move around a lot. You often don't have measures of all of the exposures over their lifetime. So it's just a very hard uh, problem. So today I'm going to focus mostly on the effects of differential pollution exposure on health at birth. Uh, most of these studies are going to be using vital statistics natality records that have information about all of the births in the United States. Um, for some states, I've been able to obtain confidential data that has the exact maternal address, and then I'm going to do a lot with that in the form of measuring whether people live near different sources of pollution. So one reason for focusing on health at birth is that it not only reflects the prenatal environment, but it's also been linked to a wide uh, range of adult outcomes. So we can say, for example, if something causes low birth weight, then it's likely linked to other problems uh, on average, like cognitive deficits or higher prevalence of ADHD, also higher prevalence of asthma and various physical health conditions. So the kind of um, model, if you like, that I have in mind is that you have pollution exposure in pregnancy, you have all the other things that are going on in pregnancy that might reflect policies, families, neighborhoods. Those affect early life health, and then early life health affects the child's adult health, the child's adult employment and earnings, the child's adult education, and then there's you know, feedbacks between all of those types of things. Okay, so why is measuring the health effects of pollution on health a hard problem? I think there's lots of reasons for this. Um, a, one reason is that the basic science that you would hope would tell you the answer to all of these questions often just isn't uh, informative. And in some cases, it's even misleading. Um, so one example is a paper by Amund, Edlund, and Pame looking at the effect of the uh, Chernobyl disaster on health and child outcomes in Sweden. And an interesting thing is that they uh, show all the reports from the time that basically said, you know, well, on the basis of the scientific evidence that we have, no one should worry about this. The amount of radiation is too low to do any possible harm, so, you know, just, if you like, stay inside, but don't worry about it. Uh, what they show, though, I think quite convincingly, because um, you have reports of exactly where the radiation went and exactly how much radiation there was, so you know exactly when people were exposed and how much they were exposed to. You can follow those cohorts over time and you can see that there are effects on the children's uh, cognitive outcomes of having been exposed at certain points. So, you know, that's one example. Uh, another thing, though, that sort of goes in the other direction is the possibility of publication bias, which is if you write a study and you show that some kind of pollution doesn't have any effect on anything, you're probably going to have a really hard time getting it published. Um, so it may be the case that a lot of the, the work um, showing positive effects could be um, sort of only part of the, the work that's out there. So that's one issue that basically we just don't know a lot about the effects of a lot of different kinds of pollution. Uh, second, and related, is that it's often very hard to find consistent and comprehensive pollution data. Uh, if you look at, you know, most countries now do some pollution monitoring, but the monitoring may be very spotty. Um, sometimes authorities are accused of doing things like moving the monitor around, 
uh, you know, to, to locate it in a low pollution place so that they don't look bad, things like that. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, another um, more fundamental issue is that we can measure proximity often very well, so we know whether you live close to some source of pollution, but then it's hard to know how much you are actually exposed. So, you know, we don't know exactly how much time that you spend in your residence compared to other locations. We don't know what kind of windows you have that affect, you know, how many things come in. We don't know what kind of air filtration system you might have. So there's a lot of things that could um, affect actual exposures. So proximity could be regarded as a very noisy measure of what people actually get exposed to. Uh, another issue that hasn't been looked at that much in the literature is whether these effects are nonlinear. Um, so one important aspect of that is, is there some kind of threshold below which pollution doesn't hurt you? Right? So implicit in a lot of regulatory approaches is the idea that there is such a threshold, right? Because we set a threshold, and then we say, oh, if pollution is above that, then people should get an alert or they should modify their behavior. But if pollution is below that, then we won't worry about it, right? So that's a nonlinear um, uh, effect that people are, are hypothesizing. But we don't actually have very good measures of that. And in fact, as we have improved our measures, we often find that levels of pollution that we thought were safe in the past turn out not to be safe. So a good example of that is lead, where the, the threshold for concern you know, started to be off being quite high uh, and has gradually been lowered over time. And now, for example, the EPA says there's no, no detectable level of lead that doesn't have a harmful health effect. Uh, another issue with trying to measure health effects using mortality is that uh, some of the people who die after some sort of an acute exposure possibly were about to die anyway. So if you're thinking about it in terms of number of life years lost, you can't just assume that everybody who dies would have had a full lifespan, and you have to take account of that. And then, uh, of course, there's also the issue that people aren't randomly assigned to locations. So we started off showing um, or talking about how poor people and people of color were located in neighborhoods that might be subject to higher levels of pollution. If we then see bad health outcomes, is that because of the pollution or is that because of all the other things that go along with being disadvantaged? Right? So there's a really formidable uh, set of problems here. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know if people could hear this on the recording, so I'll repeat it, which is he was asking about the effect of noise and noise pollution. So I would say that's another thing that's not very well measured most of the, the time and could go along, as you say, with a lot of other industrial processes. And traffic, yeah. Um, so it's a hard problem. Um, so, you know, arguably, if you really want to know what is the mechanism for pollution to harm somebody at sort of a cellular or medical level, it might be better to ask somebody else besides an economist who would run a laboratory study, you know, maybe with animals and show that there was some sort of a, an effect on some kind of body system. But I think what economists bring to the table is that uh, we do try and account for other factors, such as poverty, and we also try and account for 
for people's behavior and actually look at that behavior. For example, you know, what do people do to try and avoid pollution? Uh, what do they do when we give them information about pollution? And so those are interesting responses from a policy point of view. So uh, I'm going to talk now about a, a series of studies that link pollution exposure to infant health. Uh, a first example is a study uh, that I did with Johanna Sch Schmieder and Matthew Nidell, which looked at all, all the births in New Jersey between 1989 and 2003. We used the confidential versions of the birth records that allowed us to both link together siblings and also to geocode. And then we looked at mothers who lived near air quality monitors, so we had a continuous rating of the air. And then we compared siblings who were exposed to higher and lower amounts of pollution during the pregnancy. And what we found was that there was an effect for everybody increasing low birth weight um, by about 10%, but that the effect was much bigger for mothers who were also smokers. So it seemed like there was an interaction between one risk factor for a negative birth outcome and another risk factor. We also found larger effects for mothers who were over 35 and mothers who had medical risk factors like high blood pressure or diabetes. So, um, what this suggested was that uh, pollution could interact with some of these existing risk factors and make, the, uh, make them worse. We do see in the data that disadvantaged mothers are more likely to be exposed to pollution. I'm going to show three examples, but basically every example that I've looked at, it always comes out the same, that um, this is a feature of being disadvantaged. So uh, I will show you that disadvantaged mothers are more likely to be exposed to hazardous waste sites, uh, live near factories that emit toxic releases, and they're also more likely to live near busy roads. Okay, so uh, the first thing, looking at uh, toxic waste sites, uh, I'm going to use data from something called the Superfund program in the United States. So this was a piece of legislation that was designed to identify, prioritize, and fund the cleanup of the most hazardous waste sites. Uh, so it provided a legal mechanism for going after the polluters and trying to get money from them in order to clean up these hazardous waste sites. It started in 1980 after something called the Love Canal disaster. And what this was was a, an old canal that was used as a hazardous waste site. And then um, it was capped, and a housing development and a school were put on top of it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it actually didn't take very long for uh, people to notice um, very horrific health effects, uh, high incidence of birth defects, high incidence of kidney failure, uh, all kinds of things, because this waste site had very hazardous materials like dioxin in it. Uh, so uh, people realized, well, we don't actually even have a map showing where all of these hazardous waste sites are. They may be all over the country. We may be building housing developments on them all the time. Uh, so maybe we should do something about, uh, you know, mapping and then also remediating them. So this picture here uh, is from the EPA website and um, shows an example of a Superfund cleanup in action. And I think it's sort of fascinating to see the workers there wearing these hazmat suits, you know, because it's so dangerous to be at this location. And then you see the houses in the background, right? So those people are living there all the time. And then the workers who come have to wear hazmat suits. So, uh, so looking at birth data then, we can just map out 
Uh, what is the relationship between race, education, and whether you live near one of these sites? Uh, so here I'm just mapping or plotting whether a pregnant woman lived less than uh, one and a quarter miles from a Superfund site. And you see a very clear racial gradient here that black women are much more likely to live near a site than white women or Hispanic women in this case. Uh, and you also see some difference by education, but it's actually not very big compared to the racial difference. So it, it, for this, it seemed like racial segregation was more of an issue than income segregation. I'm also going to show you some data from something called the Toxic Release Inventory, which is another environmental program that was started after another environmental disaster. So this was started after the Union Carbide poison gas leak in Bhopal, which killed 15,000 to 20,000 people. At the time, this was considered to be the world's worst environmental disaster. And uh, what people realized in the United States was that there was a factory that was exactly the same as this one in Virginia. Uh, and people hadn't realized that there was a factory that had these dangerous chemicals in their neighborhood. So this law is, was called the Community Right to Know Act. And it's a very interesting law from an economist's point of view because it's aimed at correcting a particular market failure, which is that people didn't know that there were these factories. So that's all the law does. It says, if your factory uses more than a certain amount of a listed chemical, then you must uh, make public your emissions. So, um, and then, you know, once you make that information public, then the idea is, well, then the market's going to solve the problem or the courts will solve the problem because we'll have the information out there. We can sue for damages if there are damages and, and so on. It's actually considered to have been quite a successful piece of legislation in terms of reducing the amount of emissions, basically by embarrassing companies who are making these emissions and subjecting them to legal liability. Uh, this picture here is um, looking at Manhattan, and this is a power plant that's just across the river that is in the toxic release inventory because it releases toxic chemicals into the air in New York. Uh, and an interesting thing is that before I started working on this, I went over the, the bridge. It's the, it's the Triborough Bridge that goes from LaGuardia into Manhattan, so some of you may have been on that bridge as well. I've been on that bridge many times, and I never noticed that there was this power plant here uh, emitting toxics. Okay, so if you look at the pattern of who's exposed to this, you, this looks very similar to the uh, plot that I showed you for the Superfund sites in that you see that black women are more likely to live near one of these sites. And again, there's a small difference by education, but it's mostly about racial segregation. Now, that was just showing the raw data so you might ask, well, you know, how much of this can be explained by other characteristics of the people? Um, looking at uh, even education, age, the child's birth order, the child's gender, year of birth, and even postal codes. So looking within a relatively small area, do we still see different exposures? And the answer is yes we do still see different exposures. So I have here uh, on the same page both the pattern for Superfund sites and the pattern for toxic release inventories. And what I'm plotting is the difference between a white mother with only a high school education and other mothers. Okay? So what this is showing is that the white college-educated mothers are less likely than white mothers with only a high school education to uh, be exposed. But black college-educated women are more likely than white high school 
only women to be exposed. So again, you're seeing this, this racial pattern. Now, you might ask, well, what's the effect of different kinds of interventions on um, exposures? And so uh, I have studied two types of interventions with these two programs. One uh, with the toxic release inventory, since that's a program that's just about information, what happens if we give people more information? And so the way that you can do that is by changing the reporting standards. So there was a dramatic change, which uh, changed the thresholds when companies had to report from those that were emitting, or I should say that were using thousands of pounds of a chemical to a uh, much smaller amount, say 100 pounds, or in, in some cases with dioxin, they had to start reporting if they were using even one ounce. Um, so if you think about this from the point of view of people who are living there, even if I'm a sophisticated person, I know about the toxic release inventory, maybe I looked up the factory that's beside me and I saw, oh, they're not emitting anything dangerous, that's fine. Now, a new reporting standard comes out, and I suddenly find out, oh, they're emitting dioxin. You know, what am I going to do about it? So that's the thought experiment, number one. And then with respect to the Superfund program, as I mentioned, the way that this program works is they're supposed to prioritize sites. So they say, how dangerous is this site? And then they're supposed to clean up the most dangerous sites. And then they actually certify that now it's safe to, to be in this place. So we might ask, what's the effect of that? And so a lot of the effects here are going to depend on mobility and how people respond in terms of uh, moving into or out of neighborhoods. Okay, so looking at the effect of new information, what you see is that the really big response is actually white college-educated women they find out that something is being emitted from this plant that they didn't know about before, and they move away. Okay. But what ends up happening then is, this is not so much that black women with less than high school are moving in, it's just they end up being a higher share because they're the ones that are left behind. Okay. So you have this shift in the racial composition of the neighborhood when it becomes known that this is a dangerous neighborhood it becomes a more black neighborhood. Okay. With the Superfund sites, we actually looked at the effect of the Superfund cleanups on infant health. Here we didn't see much evidence of a mobility effect. So uh, again, if you want to think about this from the point of view of a white college-educated woman, the government tells you, oh, this was a terribly contaminated site, but don't worry, we've already cleaned it up. So do people move there? No, they don't. Um, so the people who are there are, are the same people. And we can see then that there's a, a positive effect, that is a reduction in congenital anomalies, low birth weight, prematurity, and even infant death. We did that separately for all sites, which is the light blue bars, and for the most hazardous sites that were graded to be the most hazardous. Um, the results aren't totally consistent, but we do see bigger effects on low birth weight and prematurity, which are the most common negative outcomes in our data for the most hazardous sites. Okay. So um, I would characterize the literature on um, environmental health as being a process of trying to find sharper and more convincing tests that there's actually causal effects going on. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few different uh, attempts to do that. One is the impact of implementing Easy Pass, which was just electronic toll collections. Uh, second are openings and closings of plants that are emitting these environmental toxins. And the Third is talking about the effects of uh, delays at airline hubs, which are big sources of pollution. 
uh, and also incorporating wind directions. You can look at people upstream and downstream of the uh, pollution. Okay, so this uh, study with Reed Walker looks at the introduction of electronic toll collection in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And a nice thing about this was that it was, it was rolled out according to a schedule. The transit authority said, we're going to do this. The purpose was not to reduce pollution. The purpose was to uh, improve driving conditions by making it so that you didn't have to stop at a toll plaza and pay. You could just drive through with the electronic transponder on your car. Okay. So um, an interesting feature of this is that it was very popular. Right? So a lot of environmental regulations are not popular if they result in job losses or something like that, but this was just making everybody's drive better. So people were happy and there was a very fast um, take-up of this that people would go and buy these transponders. We use the detailed microdata with exact addresses so that we can compute how far away people were from toll plazas. And then, um, since you know, uh, living along a busy road is a disamenity, we want to compare people who live near toll plazas, you know, not to people who live in the woods somewhere, but to other people who live along busy highways, just not close to a toll plaza. So. That's kind of the strategy, and we use difference in difference. This map is showing where all the toll plazas were. This is putting New Jersey and Pennsylvania together. And there's a, a little picture up at the top there just showing what one of these plazas look like. So if you go through the lane that says, easy pass, no cash, you just drive straight through. Otherwise, you have to go to the side and and pay. Okay, so as I mentioned, we want to compare mothers who are near the toll plaza to those who are further away. The way that we operationalized that was, uh, you notice we're switching to metric here, finally, um, that we look at mothers who are within two kilometers or 1.5 kilometers of a toll plaza and compare them to women who are two to 10 kilometers from a toll plaza, but living right close to a highway. Um, we first check that the maternal characteristics and housing prices are not changing with Easy Pass, and we don't see, again, a lot of mobility or changing of the people who live near these toll plazas. Um, we exclude people who live more than five kilometers from a toll plaza, and uh, we're going to include interactions of whether you're close to a toll plaza and a linear time trend, just in case there's something else that's changing over time in these areas. We also try excluding people who we estimate have a very high propensity either to live near a toll plaza or not to live near a toll plaza. And we also try estimating models with, with mother fixed effects as a robustness check. Uh, so the main results can be summarized in this figure where we show that before Easy Pass, the people who live near the toll plaza have higher rates of premature birth, but that after the toll plaza, the rates converge, or after the toll plaza converts to Easy Pass. These effects are actually quite large. Um, we find um, relative to the baseline levels of low birth weight that it's about a 10% effect. Um, we also look separately at low birth weight. Since most uh, low birth weight babies are premature, those things should look pretty much the same, and they do. Um, and so we also do a kind of back of the envelope calculation to say that, well, in the three years after this easy pass conversion, we probably reduce the number of premature births uh, by 255 to 275. So that's not a huge increase or, or decrease in premature births, but um, it's 
statistically significant and continuing presumably over time with this policy. Looking at toxic pollutants from industrial plants, this is again using data from the toxic release inventory. Our data on the amount of toxics is not very good. It's mostly from engineering reports rather than from actual measurements. And so what we do is say, okay, we know that this plant produces some sort of toxic. So what we're going to look at is whether the plant was operating or whether the plant wasn't operating. And so when it's operating, it's presumably emitting toxics. When it's not operating, it's not emitting toxics. And this is a, a, another picture from the EPA website, um, which has lots of information on it, showing uh, a, a toxic release inventory site. And you can see if the smokestacks there right behind some houses, so it could be affecting people's health. So, um, of course, we know that there's economic benefits from industrial plants, but a cost is that they emit a lot of toxic uh, pollutants. Uh, there's at least 80,000 different chemical compounds that are emitted, and most of them have not undergone any kind of toxicity testing. I think the, the European Union is ahead of the U.S. on this in terms of doing toxicity testing, but still there's a great deal that's unknown. Uh, a lot of these toxics are not very well monitored, and they're not very well regulated. Um, so, for example, I, I think this is kind of a shocking example, was that there wasn't actually any standard in the U.S. for mercury, which we've known for decades is highly toxic, until 2011, when this um, mercury and air toxic standards was released. So um, I put a question here as well. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the kind of oldest strands of the environmental uh, economics literature looks at hedonics and says, you know, well, if, there's, if this is harmful, then it should be... Uh, it should be incorporated into housing prices. So you might ask yourself, okay, uh, so the homeowners are all assumed to know about this because it's incorporated into housing prices, so it's just the economists who are, are stupid and don't uh, know what the effect of this is. Right? So there's a real question, I think, about these hedonic approaches, whether it's fair to assume that people already know about the hazards when scientists haven't measured what the hazards are. So our research design for this is that um, first we ask, well, how far away do you need to be from one of these plants before you can no longer detect the pollution? Uh, and that's one of these things where you might hope that you could look at an engineering report and it would tell you how far are these things transported from the plants. It turns out that there isn't uh, very much literature like that, so that was the first thing that we had to do. Uh, and I'll show you some uh, estimates that suggest that for a lot of these toxic pollutants, you can uh, detect them in a radius around a mile from the plant. So then what we do is to say, okay, if we look at people one mile around the plant, maybe they're being exposed to the pollution when the plant is operating. People who are one to two miles away from the plant should still be getting the economic benefit, whatever it is, from that plant operating, but arguably are less exposed to the pollution. So we can compare the treatment group of people who live very close to the plant to people who live a little bit further away, who are still getting the economic benefits, but not all of the pollution. So the fundamental assumption there is that the economic benefit is the same for uh, both sets of people. The data sources for this include the Environmental Protection Agency's Toxic Release Inventory, uh, the Census Bureau, which gave us the information about whether the plant was opened or closed at a particular time, 
um, the um, statistical establishment list, which gave some of the same information, property sales tax data, and birth certificate data from these five states. So, as I mentioned, one of the problems here is saying, okay, if we want to implement this kind of design where we're looking at people close and people who are far away, what's close and what's far enough not to be very affected? So, in order to do this, we used data from hazardous air pollutant monitors, uh, which began to be monitored in the United States in 1998, and they've been gradually putting in monitors over time. Uh, it's still very spotty monitoring, but by 2003, there were 84 different hazardous air pollutants that were being monitored. So standardizing each pollutant to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, we match each factory with all the pollutants in a radius around it, and then we ask, like, okay, if there happen to be these monitors, if I look at this monitor, can I still detect pollution? If I look at this monitor, can I still detect pollution? And so on, as I go further away. So this is showing for two chemicals, benzene and cumene, what the results of that uh, exercise are. On the bottom here, this is showing the number of monitors that exist at different distances from the plant. So here's a... You know, there's at least one plant that has a benzene monitor very close to it, and then you can see that there's some plants that have benzene monitors within two miles of them. So we're using all of the data from all of the monitors, and then if we graph the readings of benzene from these monitors, what we get is a curve that looks like that. So you can see that within a mile, if the monitor happens to be within a mile of a plant producing benzene, I can detect benzene at the monitor. If I move and look at monitors that are more than a mile away, I can no longer detect the benzene. So we saw that this was actually a, a fairly general pattern for the 84 different HAPs that we could actually look at. So that's how we chose the one mile versus one to two mile comparison groups. Okay. This figure is summarizing our main results. You see we have like one not significant um, wrong signed result here for people in the 0 to 1,000 birth weight bin. Uh, the reason why that's so noisy is because there aren't very many surviving infants with the, that low of a birth weight, so it's a very small number of observations. When we move to the next two bins, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 grams and 1,500 grams to 2,000 grams, you see there's an increase in low birth weight. Uh, and, so the, and then there's also some decrease across the, the other categories, which are much uh, larger in terms of uh, number of observations. Okay, so what this is showing is that residents close to one of these plants has a negative effect on birth weight. Or that is, it increases the incidence of low birth weight. What we found also was that 40% of all the births in these states were within a mile of a plant with toxic releases. So there are a lot of people who are potentially affected. And then, as I showed you initially, the black mothers were much more likely to be living near one of these plants. Uh, so sort of going through the calculations, we estimate that the plant opening increased low birth weight by one to two percent, or one to two percentage points. It's about, again, about a 10 percent effect. Um, interestingly, when we looked at housing prices, we also saw an effect on housing prices, but only for people who are much closer to the plant. So thinking about it in terms of, of a mismatch of information, the people who are living within a half a mile of the plant seem to know that there's something bad about that because it's reflected in the housing prices. But there are people who are living just a little bit further away who are also negatively affected, 
but that's not reflected in the housing prices. So we can actually show that there's some mismatch there between what's being reflected in the housing prices and what's showing up as a health effect. Um, when we look at differences between black and white mothers, we estimate that about 6% of the gap in low birth weight between white college-educated mothers and black high school dropout mothers could be due to toxic releases. And so that's only one source of pollution. Uh, and so I think it shows that cumulatively, exposure to these different sources of pollution could be uh, implicated in some of these differences. OK, so thinking about, again, what are we going to do about this? Um, a very important piece of environmental legislation in the United States is the Clean Air Acts, which is, at this point, more than 50 years old, passed in 1970. It's by far the largest US environmental program. And what it does is it sets national air quality standards for these criterion air pollutants. It's administered at the county by pollution level. So every year what happens is that the EPA says, well, is this county out of compliance with the standard? If it is out of compliance with the standard, then the EPA has power to order many uh, different kinds of actions. They can even order plants to be closed. They can order plants to uh, buy costly equipment. They can order plants to purchase pollution offsets. There's a lot of things that they can do. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting piece of legislation just because it's so far-reaching. Now, uh, spotty monitoring actually makes it kind of hard to see what the effects are. So this is a map, uh, again, at the county level. And counties that don't have EPA monitors for any pollutant are shown in green. Um, so the blue are the only places that have the monitors. And so you can see that uh, most of the US, in fact, doesn't have any monitors. So presumably, those counties are never considered to be out of compliance because they don't measure anything. So what uh, I have done in some recent work with Reed Walker and John Vorhus is use uh, national data at a one kilometer by one kilometer grid level that's obtained by using neural networks and sort of feeding in all the available pollution data to uh, impute data for the entire country. So all the available pollution data includes the data that's from ground monitors, data from satellites, which gives you inf information about particulate matter, data about the weather, uh, data about forest fires, which is a big issue right now. Um, so all of the available data. And then what you do is you check to see that your imputation is reasonable by comparing the imputed points to the actual uh, ground monitors where you have a ground monitor. Okay? So by doing this, you can get data for the whole country for the first time. And so then we use that to look at racial gaps in exposure to PM2.5, which are the smallest particles, which are thought to be the most harmful. And we can look at both mean differences, but also different quantiles of the distribution to try and get some idea about how much certain people are likely to be exposed to very high levels of pollution. So then we ask, uh, well, what we show is that there's a closing of the racial gap over this period, and that uh, a large part of that is due to tightening standards under the Clean Air Act. So this is a figure um, taking census data. So it's saying for every person in the United States, if we match them to pollution data from this one kilometer by one kilometer grid, what's the difference in pollution between blacks and whites? And so you can see that over this whole period that we're looking at, there is a difference that uh, black people are more likely to be exposed to PM2.5 than white people. But the gap narrows substantially around 2007 and then stays 
uh, lower. Okay. Now, you could ask, how much of that gap can you explain by people's characteristics? And in the census data, we have a lot of characteristics, education, whether you're a homeowner, age, how many kids you have, you know, everything. Um, and so what I'm showing here is on the um, left-hand side, um, the actual gap between black and white. And then on the right-hand side, the residual gap. So this is the residual after controlling for everything in the census data. And the, uh, the two lines look identical, pretty much. So what that tells you is that none of these variables in the census data, people's education, income, and so on, explain this gap in pollution exposure between black and white. Okay. So again, it seems to be about racial segregation in housing and not explained by income, education, and so on. We can also look at how um, this ch changed over time, and in particular, whether it seems to be due to mobility. So one of the things that could be happening is it could be that black people are moving from highly polluted areas to less polluted areas. But the blue line here shows that there's no change in the covariance between census tract air quality and the share of African Americans over time. Now, the red line shows that there is some change in the covariance between air quality and the share white over time. Uh, it, it actually starts off negative, which says that if you have an area that's more white, it has better air quality. Okay? But that advantage erodes a little bit over time. So what that is reflecting is a trend over this period for uh, white people to move back to central cities. So places like Manhattan, you had a big inflow of, of white population. People got exposed to more pollution when they did that, and that narrows the gap between black and white somewhat. We estimate that that only accounts, though, for about 10% of the narrowing of the gap, leaving um, most of it, at this point, unexplained. So I'll go on and try and explain that using new standards for PM 2.5 that were proposed in 1997. Okay, so the EPA um, had been regulating PM 10, so those are bigger particles, and then the science showed that small particles, PM 2.5, were actually worse. So they should be monitoring and regulating PM 2.5. So the EPA attempted to do that by, by putting out new regulations, and industry strongly opposed that and filed uh, lawsuits to prevent the implementation of those standards. Then it took eight years for that to go through the courts, and sort of suddenly, in April 2005, the court ruled in favor of the EPA and the standards went into effect. So it's kind of an interesting example in the sense that everybody knew what the new standards were. Everybody knew that PM 2.5 was supposed to be harmful and that there were these new standards, but the exact moment when they would go into effect was highly uncertain, and indeed there was some possibility that they would never go into effect if the um, plaintiffs had won their suit. So this offers uh, an... Uh, opportunity to look at the effect of these new standards on racial gaps. In the end, there were 205 counties that were in 20 different states that were out of attainment with the new standard. Right? So they had been in attainment, and now suddenly they're out of attainment, so now they're going to be ordered to do things to clean up the air. And so... Um, what you might expect is that this would have a bigger effect on African Americans than whites because African Americans were more likely to be in highly polluted areas. So what I'm showing here is just a distribution by each 20th of the pollution um, distribution. 
and then showing where whites live compared to where blacks live. So you can see whites are sort of fairly uniformly distributed over pollution levels, a little bit more likely to be in places with low pollution, a little bit less likely to be in the highest pollution places. In contrast, African Americans are highly skewed to be in the places that have the highest pollution, and there's hardly any African Americans in the really low pollution areas. Okay? So remember, the way that this law works is that if you're above some threshold, then you have to do something. Right? So the high pollution areas are going to be the targeted ones, um, and the low pollution areas are not going to have to do anything. Okay. We estimate the effect of the Clean Air Act on these different quantiles using recentered influence functions. Um, and so the idea here is to sort of transform the problem by considering the effect of a covariate, in this case the uh, being subject to the Clean Air Act, on the population share that's below some quantile. These estimates then show the effect uh, on the cumulative density function of pollution, and given that effect, then we can back out what is the estimated effect at a given quantile. So, uh, Furpo, uh, Fortin, Lemieux show that regressing this recentered influence function on covariates gives you the effect of the covariates on the statistic that you're interested in. So it's a very handy uh, way to look at the entire distribution. This method also provides a really simple way of performing a sort of traditional Oaxaca blinder composition where you want to say, well, how much is due to changes in the x variables and how much is due to changes in the coefficients. Uh, you first transform the outcome variable and then you basically run a regression. Uh, so using this, we can say how much observed characteristics explain at the 10th percentile of the distribution, the 90th percentile, and so on. Okay. So when we do this, we can get race-specific estimates of the effects of the Clean Air Acts in each quantile. And you see uh, the pattern that I'm showing here. So basically, there's no effect on the low pollution areas. That's what you expect. And then there's a uh, big effect starting at about the 50th or 60th percentile. And the effects are systematically bigger for African Americans than for whites at the higher pollution quintile. So that's saying like even within a small area, the black people in the area are more likely to be exposed. That's what I showed you earlier, that even within a postal code, black people were more likely to be exposed. Okay, so then we use our estimates to compute the fraction of the racial convergence that's explained by these differential effects of the CAA. And um, what we find is that over 60% of the decline in the racial gap in exposure to PM2.5 can be explained by these changes in the enforcement of the Clean Air Act. So it's a very powerful thing, and just in simple terms, since it targets the most polluted areas and the you know, poorest people and African Americans live in the most polluted areas, then anything that targets the most polluted areas is going to have a uh, disproportionate benefit for the most disadvantaged people. Okay? So this is an example where a general piece of environmental legislation, which was not written specifically with environmental justice in mind, can still have the effect of improving environmental justice by benefiting the most disadvantaged people the most. Okay, so thinking about um, these effects on birth weight and you know, how important they are for later life, there's a very nice paper by Eisen Walker and Rosen Slater that uses the Clean Air Act to try and look at the long-term effects. So what they do is they look at cohorts who uh, are born in polluted counties. Some of those counties have pollution levels that are above the threshold, 
when the Clean Air Act comes in, those have to clean up. Some of them are just below the threshold. They don't have to clean up. So this is kind of a classic uh, regression discontinuity type of setup. And what they find is that the cohorts who are born um, after the Clean Air Act have lower pollution levels in early life. And then they can follow those people up in um, administrative data to try and see what is the effect on their employment and earnings. So summarizing their effects, there's this figure, uh, which is showing changes in the earnings percentile for the affected cohort compared to the cohort that was not affected. Okay. So this big negative bar here is showing that there's a big decline in people in the lowest earnings percentile. Um, what that reflects is, you know, you're in the lowest earnings percentile if you have zero earnings. In other words, you're not in the labor force at all. So there's a very big uh, decline in the fraction of the cohort that is not able to work. And the increase comes in the middle of the distribution that you have more people who are um, earning you know, between the 10th the and the um, 75th percentile of the earnings distribution. Okay, so you're moving people out of presumably disability of some sort into gainful employment through uh, reducing pollution at the time of the birth. They again, go through a uh, back-of-the-envelope calculation, trying to say what the magnitudes of all of this are. And uh, the bottom line of that is that they estimate that it's about $6.5 billion per year. Um, and they argue that for various reasons, including the measurement error that I talked about at the beginning, that this is likely to be a lower bound on the true benefits. I want to talk about one more paper in my uh, few minutes that I have left. This is a paper by Schlenker and Walker that I think uses a really ingenious identification strategy. So what they're looking at is daily variation in pollution at airports in California, which is caused by weather disruptions in other places. So um, we have a hub-and-spoke system for airline traffic. If there's a uh, bad weather in Chicago or bad weather in New York, that can cause a ground stoppage in Los Angeles because they won't let the plane take off if it's not going to be able to land in Chicago. So the plane sits there on the ground idling and emitting a lot of pollution. So on those days, you get very high pollution. And then the people around the airports may be affected by the higher pollution level. So uh, they have sort of three different versions of their model where they look at everybody who lives around the airport. They uh, look at people who live near the airport and interact that with the amount of taxi time. And then the third version also looks at wind direction. And then the outcomes that they're looking at are hospitalizations uh, for, for various conditions. So uh, this figure is sort of neat, showing the prevailing wind directions at different airports. Um, so you can see, for example, Los Angeles, the wind blows off the ocean, so mostly the pollution is going to go east. Um, and so that's some of the variation that they're using. And then in terms of the estimates, um, I've underlined model three here in each panel um, because that's the one that is their best estimate that takes account of wind direction and so on. Uh, and so what this is showing is increases in hospitalization for asthma, acute respiratory conditions, all respiratory conditions, and heart problems. Then they have some... Uh, other conditions that they don't think should be so affected, like strokes, bone fractures, appendicitis, they don't find effects on those. Uh, so they have some control conditions. And 
The top two panels here are looking at all ages. The bottom two panels are using the children below five. So you can see, um, or maybe you can't see, depending on the type size. Um, anyway, what this is showing is that the uh, effects for children are much larger than the effects for the entire population. So that's what I was saying earlier, that effects tend to be larger for the youngest and the oldest. But a nice thing about this paper is that they also uh, can look at effects on people in the ages in between. Um, so they conclude that a one standard deviation increase in pollution levels leads to one million in hospitalizations for the six million people who live within 10 kilometers of an airport. So it's actually pretty costly when you have these increases in pollution days. So um, just to summarize then, uh, I've showed you that black children and poor children are more likely to be exposed to pollution beginning in the prenatal period. I think this is likely to have profound effects on a range of adult outcomes. So what this shows is that economic inequality and environmental inequalities are reinforcing. Environmental policy can help to remedy these disparities and so try and break this cycle. Uh, for example, 60% of the decline in the racial gap in exposure uh, can be explained by you know, one change in the enforcement of the Clean Air Acts. In terms of directions for future research, I think there's lots of things to be done here. Um, some less explored areas are in terms of heterogene heterogene sorry, heterogeneous effects. Um, also, as I pointed out, looking at people of prime age, uh, prime age workers, um, there's some recent work in developing country settings which often have much higher levels of pollution than what I've been talking about here and so presumably have worse health effects. So I'm aware of research in China, India, Brazil, Turkey, but obviously there's many other places where this kind of work could be done. Uh, work on new pollutants such as the hazardous air pollutants that I was talking about would be useful. There's Still, we really don't have very good data about the human health effects of those. Um, this idea about whether there really is a threshold that uh, where these pollutants aren't harmful would be useful to know more about. Uh, it also, it's also good to have more subtle human capital measures than just like, did people die or not, right? Uh, we think that there might be lots of effects on worker productivity, for instance, that would be good to measure. Um, this new pollution data, I think, has a lot of possibilities. In principle, it can be improved. Maybe you could even get smaller grids than one kilometer by one kilometer. And then uh, it's very exciting to think about um, what can be achieved by better information, uh, better regulation, and also about technological change. Uh, I'll just end by saying that um, in some work with Reed Walker, we did a kind of retrospective of 50 years of economic research about the Clean Air Act, so to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Clean Air Act. And we found a really curious thing, which was that the economic research had systematically overestimated the cost of pollution regulation and underestimated the benefit. Now, why was that? Well, it was because in terms of the cost, the analysis usually did not take account of technological change. And the idea that when you make new pollution regulations, you often create a market for pollution control and an incentive for innovation. So things like requiring automobiles to have cleaner admissions turned out to be much cheaper than the initial estimates had suggested. So that's on the cost side. On the benefits side, um, most of the benefits are in terms of human health. And we keep finding that levels of pollution that are lower than were previously thought harmful, still have harmful effects. 
which means that we underestimate the benefits when we uh, don't consider the effects of these low levels of, of pollution. So I think that economists as a group should kind of learn a lesson from this and um, uh, be less negative about pollution regulation than we have been. Thank you very much for the excellent lecture. And then for the audience, do you have any questions? We have some time. You are totally amazed. Matti, <laughs> Matti I know you are raising your hand. Like. <laughs> Thank you very much for the... Uh, for a fascinating lecture. So I think we learned a lot, and I also think you generated kind of a dozen new papers that, you know, this is a room full of PhD students and, and other people who are thinking, looking for good research ideas and who, who, who have great access to data. Um, so I was, you're actually answering my, my, the question I tried to a ask already at the end of the first lecture here, that where should we look at? But where is the larger kind of marginal benefits of what kind of questions to ask? So, so, so if you would like to go back to the first lec lecture and, and and talk a little bit about that also in in, in the topics that you you discussed there. Well, I actually think that some of the questions that came up in the discussion after the first lecture are are very interesting. I um. I try and encourage my students to think about doing health and political economy because I think that a lot of the issues about why certain health policies are adopted or not adopted are actually political issues and not having to do with, um, even with economic issues necessarily. And um, so far, none of my students have taken me up on this, but I, I do think that that, uh, you know, having somebody take a serious look at questions like, well, why, why and when do uh, pieces of legislation that impact health get passed would be a really interesting topic. Um, so that's one thing. I, I did also end my lecture talking about... Um, so there has been a lot more research, just I would say in the last couple of years even, on mental health. But um, honestly, the first paper that I wrote on mental health, I sent it off to a journal, and I got back a thing that said, well, you know, this is a very nice paper, but it's not of general interest. <laughs> so you know, now it seems to be more general interest. Uh, but I think there's lots of room for, for research on that. Um, I think it's controversial to think that economists can say something about treatment, but I do think that we can say something about treatment because we have m basically more experience using these large-scale data sets than anybody else. And so, um, you know, looking at things like... Uh, determinants of particular treatments and then the long-term effects of that, um, I, I think is interesting. And then uh, a last thing that I'll say, which I also uh, alluded to in the first lecture, was thinking about adolescence as an important period, I think is, is something that's long overdue. So we have um, some argument that Early childhood is really special, and I think it is really special, but that doesn't mean that interventions in adolescence are, are useless. And that's one of the uh, points that the paper by Hendren and Sprunkheiser makes explicitly is when they looked at programs for adolescents that were well evaluated, and there's not very many of them, but when they look at them, the returns are, this, are just as great as the returns for young children. So it could be the case that this idea that, you know, if you don't invest in early childhood, then it's too late, is just wrong and harmful, and that maybe we should be doing, you know, 
giving people a second chance in adolescence and thinking about programs that work for that group also. And there was a question from Anne. Thanks again for a very interesting presentation. This is a question more on a personal note. So that, that how do you feel like, um, how rewarding or difficult has it been working in a multidisciplinary environment as an economist? I mean, learning about these chemicals and health impacts and environmental regulation, whatever you have to learn about when you are doing this kind of research. Uh, that's a good question. So I have had to learn a lot about different things. And, um, you know, so you start by reading the literature and trying to figure out what's, what's what. I also try and talk to people a lot in other fields and see what they think. Um, I think there's a balance to doing that because sometimes uh, what they tell you isn't right even though they're the experts. <laughs> you know, experts can still be wrong. Um, so it's good to sort of think about what people say, but kind of reserve the, the right or the openness to see whether the received wisdom might not be totally correct. So any more questions, Kaisa? See the... There. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to go back to the topic of the first lecture. And this is something that was already touched upon, um, I guess, also in the discussion afterwards, but I would like to go back to. So the, um, the effects of Medicaid expansion, I guess they relate mostly to people who were uninsured uh, beforehand. Um, so I'm just trying to think about, you know, something that's happening in Finland at the moment and whether there's some relevance of that literature or, or other types of you know, other related literature to, to these developments. So what we are seeing now here is that there are, you know, shortages in, in public health care coverage, um, which is making people, um, you know, transfer towards private insurance, especially for young kids. So do you think, you know, does, does this literature or other literature that you know of have something to say about that kind of a shift moving from public insurance to more private insurance? Yeah, I, I, people, people sort of like to think of the U.S. as a place with private insurance and the rest of the world as a place with public insurance. That is not actually the case, as you're pointing out. Most places have a combined system. And in the U.S., actually, public expenditures per capita are, are as large as in um, many other European countries, it's just that the private expenditures are huge on top of that. Uh, so then we end up with a very costly system. I, I think the problem with healthcare is that it's so expensive <laughs> that uh, if you're going to have an entirely public funded system, um, you're going to have to have very high taxes to support that. Um, so it may be the case that most places end up with a system that has um, like a basic insurance and then people have to pay more if they want more. Um, the, the trouble with the U.S. system is that they haven't done a very good job of uh, providing that floor. So there's still a lot of people who kind of fall through the cracks. And at the same time... Um, the private system is actually heavily subsidized because um, it, private insurance benefits are not taxed, right? So it, it's sort of not fair to be, uh, you know, not providing basic services to poorer people, but then subsidizing very expensive private health insurance for other people. So, so far, attempts to get rid of that big subsidy for wealthier people have completely failed. Um, but it seems like that would be the 
the mistake that other countries shouldn't fall into is like subsidizing this private health insurance. If people want to pay for that out of their own pockets, I don't see how you could prevent that or why you would want to prevent it even. Um, but the public sector should not be subsidizing it. Any more questions? Just quickly, uh, there's a big like, discussion about um, uh, air quality inside dwellings. And uh, there you have the regulations, and there you have the technologies to affect air quality. And I think that much of what you talked about raises similar questions and uh, like, uh, asks for new research results what to do about it, because there's regulations, law, uh, and, and technologies that are all involved. So I just leave it here. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I, um, I didn't talk about this so much, but you know, the kind of work that I'm doing where you have millions of observations and you have a pretty noisy measure of pollution exposure, if you have millions of observations, you can still find the signal that's there in the data. The alternative is to have much better quality measures, but then those data sets typically are very small. You know, so there's epidemiological studies where people wear a backpack, it measures exactly what they were exposed to, but if you have a tiny sample and a relatively small effect, it's going to be hard to show uh, a causal relationship there. Okay. If there will be no more questions. May I uh, end this uh, seminar? Thank you, Professor Janet Uri, again. <laughs>